Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, wonderful, beautiful Sunday afternoon. Uh, we've just had some rain, which was certainly very well needed within the community and within the park and everything. So I'd like to welcome you to the Edison Park Community Group webinar. My name is Mark Curry, and I am a member of the Edison Park Community Group. This webinar is not put on by the city of Huntington Beach. Let me repeat that. This webinar is not put on by the city of Huntington Beach. Our goal is to inform you about the city's redevelopment plan of Edison Park and put forth our own alternative design to conceptual plan C that the city is continuing to advocate for. We will provide you an overview of some park history, our community group activities, and walk you through the community-based design plan. Afterwards, you can give us feedback, send the city council your reaction to their conceptual plan C, and for the alternative designs we are presenting today. Let me start with a little bit of history. The area now known as Edison Park was used as a landfill between 1957 and 1969. What was dumped is relatively little unknown and thought to be mostly construction waste. Per tests done by the city, the material lies between two and three feet below the surface of the park. The park was first developed in February of 1974 and dedicated on April 8, 1974. The park's original designers were Richard Bigler and Associates. This is a direct quote from the park from the city's own website. The city of Huntington Beach in collaboration with RJM Design Group, is preparing a conceptual plan for Edison Park. The conceptual plan will guide current and future park and recreation develop, development at Edison Park based on community-wide input and needs. Between May of 2021 and October of 2021, during the COVID pandemic, RJM conducted three in-person sessions and an online survey. The local community and park neighbors were not informed of these meetings via either email or snail mail. RJM posted signs in the community center, but many users of the park do not go into the community center. The community center was also closed for renovations during part of this time. So by mid-October, RJM was ready to present their design to the city. On November 8th, 2021, the Community and Library Services Commission voted 6-0 to send the original Edison Park conceptual plan to the city council for full approval over the objections of the local community. The local residents and neighbors of the park were not happy with the lack of communications from the city or RJM about the park and the major changes RJM had proposed. This included the loss of about a hundred more trees to make way for additional parking and sports fields. On November 12th, 2021, members of the community met with Council Member Mosier, then City Manager Oliver Chi, and Director Salama. The meeting was to discuss the proposed changes to the park and see what could be done to save the old growth trees slated at being cut down. On November 15, 2021, one week after the commission approved the plan, RJM and the city staff presented three options to the city council. The options were the original plan the commission had approved and two modified plans, option B and option C, that came out of the informal community meeting previously mentioned. In a seven to zero vote, the city council voted to accept option C. Due to option C's multitude of problems seen by the community, we decided to form the Edison Park Community Group. 
This group is now comprised of over 400 families and includes many different users of the park, dog walkers, basketball players, handball players, the AYSO Soccer Association, and many groups we felt the city nor RJM had included in their outreach to the community. Due to increased pressure from the community, the city council withdrew their approval on March 1st, 2022, requesting the city staff to do further outreach to the community. During this time, Edison Park Community Group put out a much more open and realistic survey to not only our group, but also the general population around the park. We shared these results with the Community and Library Services Commission, Director Salama, Deputy Director Waisaki, and the City Council. To have a true community park, you must first start with the community's wants and needs. The city held a community workshop on August 4th. A community survey was also posted online through RJM's website. This workshop identified only four basic topics of concern from all of the community input received through both RJM's website and directly to the city via email. Trees, soccer, pickleball, and sports park. Four questions were asked in which you could put together either a green post-it note for yes or a pink post-it note for no upon a poster of option C that was on an easel. All of the questions were loaded and based on RJM's original option C design. The online survey was just the same four questions, but in digital form. Answers were limited to a specific number of characters not words. By mid-September, the Edison Park Community Group had come up with our own design and presented it to Director Salama and Deputy Director Waisaki. With the election of the majority of the City Council approaching, the Edison Park Community Group wanted to present its plan to the entire group of 400 families plus and to the candidates to discover where they stand and to help our group make the decision for whom to vote. We wanted to get this information out sooner than later, and thus the webinar today. I would like to turn this over to our next presenter. You're muted. Greetings from the Edison Park Community Group. I am Ding Jo Curry. I'm also a member of the group. I'm going to talk about our Edison Park Community Group's work. You know, when a community park is being redesigned, the community needs to be involved. When the city left most of the communities and park users out, we took it upon ourselves to look after the interest and the needs of the community. The Edison Park Community Group is 100% grassroots community effort formed after the city council approved an ill-conceived plan with minimal community participation. We started with a small group of committed residents and park users, and it just grew from there. While you are only seeing the three of us today, there are plenty of others behind the scenes. We did the best we could to inform the residents and users of the park. We walked neighborhoods, the park, and pass out flyers on foot at first. Thanks to First Team Realty, Danny Walker Brown and Rosemary Sire, we were able to do mailers to over 5,000 homes an A-mail center also gave us discounts on printing. That's why there are a lot of people behind our effort. We held two major community gatherings with hundreds in attendance. We were able to galvanize 400 families to our group's list. 
who are not only interested, but also passionate about the future of Edison Park. As you heard earlier, we were able to stop city's conceptual plan C from moving forward on March 1st. We applaud the mayor, Barbara de Aguilés, and the city council for believing and responding to our concerns. We begin to ensure all park users are included and local residents informed. We also choose to use the peaceful consultative process to work with our community groups. As you can tell, there are many emotions about this, but we try to remain a calm consultative uh, mode to work with the communities at all times. More importantly, I think it's important to point out that we always first approach the city and park library director, Chris Lama and Ashley Walkowski well, Saki, I'm sorry, expressing our desire to work with them to achieve maximum community engagement, input, and feedback. However, we were not consulted regarding the community outreach workshops and the city's survey, unfortunately. We studied the city's original survey and thought it truly lacked openness and inclusion. We decided to conduct our own community survey and received 375 valid responses. There were many problems linking uh, Plan C with even the original responses that the city did. While the city's question were all about what you wish to add to the park and where do you put these things, we first asked what and how people use the current park right now. There, I think that is so important to first ask, how do people currently use the park to begin with? The great majority of the people responded said, sitting, walking, enjoying the park. This is no surprise actually to us who use the park on a daily basis for, uh, from our own usage observations. Well, we not only ask what they wish to add, like the city asked, but we also ask what they do not wish to lose, what people not wish to lose. It's just as important what they wish to add. There is a big difference in finding that balance of what can be added without mindful of what you're not willing to sacrifice. In addition, we ask people what features they do not want to change or remove, as well as what improvement the community wish to see. After all, we're the ones who use the park on a daily basis. All of our queries were very open-ended and what people didn't want to lose are the trees open in green spaces, walking paths. What people want to improve is overwhelmingly the restrooms and trash cans and better children playgrounds and walking paths and maintenance. Of course, we, that was no surprise to us. So the city's outreach since March 4th was limited. Yes, some signs were put up and it's still on a passive mode. Uh, you can send in if you see those signs and send in your comments. The city's outreach, the real workshop on August 4th and the online survey that followed was very disappointing. Again, we asked the city to involve us in the planning of that and we were not involved in the planning. The community anticipated an open forum for exchange of ideas and feedback. Unfortunately, it was a presentation defending conceptual plan C, followed by four very leading loaded binary yes or no questions for individuals to vote using little post-it notes, as Mark said, red for yes, green for no. Anyone who understands simple research methodologies would know those type of questions garner responses with preferred biases to what you desire to receive as responses, or the responses simply can't produce clarity. Tiny little post-it notes is not ways to solicit any meaningful or substantive feedback or suggestions. An online survey 
with the same four questions followed, it was crystal clear to the community at that time. There was no genuine interest in listening to any ideas except to defend RJM's original conceptual plan C. It was then that the Edison Park community group decided no longer trusting what the city is going to do next now, we better just take it upon ourselves. We decided that we must put forward an alternative plan to the city's conceptual plan C. We want to demonstrate that with intentionality, openness, thoughtfulness, true professional design skills, we can be responsive and responsible when we go about redesigning parks for the community. We talked to a lot of people and did extensive studies on the city's own survey results, frankly found lots of holes and our own responses received. We met with soccer AYSO 56 leadership, talked to softball people, handball associations, pickleball players, basketball players, skaters, dog walkers, bikers, people in wheelchairs. We talked to a lot of people. We consulted and toured the park with landscape design experts who teaches the subject, geostructural engineers, park maintenance workers, and other many other park users. Trust me, we talked to a lot of people. And then we came up with a design that we felt has to abide some principles and values of the community. So these are the set of principles and values as foundational to our design. First, balance, balance. RJM's design conceptual plan C without, is without balance. We said that many of times, we consider all current and future park users as not just as plainly sports users. The environment, yes, we, we do not want, or we do want to save as many, I guess, if not all of the mature health issues that have been here for decades. They're not only environmentally essential to human beings, but also to the wildlife there are also residents and users of the park. Green space, there's a lot of comments in need about green space. And that's one of the beauty of this park. There's very little undesigned, I should say undesigned, excuse me, undesignated green space left in conceptual plan C for most of the park users. Yet the green space is one of the most important value and desire features of this park based on the survey results, the cities and ours. Park character, this park was thoughtfully designed with a complementary passive and active parts. There are also aesthetic design elements that have made this park so pleasant to be in and user-friendly to so many. RJM's plan is not design work but filling the space and squeezing everything. That is the last thing you would, you would get from a designer. Respect to park neighbors. Um, first of all, the first round, uh, residents across the street was not, didn't even know. So now we're talking about having some respect to park neighbors, mindful of traffic flow, parking, lights, and noise pollutions park neighbors. We like a lot of people coming to the visit. So park neighborhood have always used to lots of people parking on the streets. That's not been something that we actually mind. We like the life in the park. Heart, heart-based. I think this is so essential. One of the things that you will hear later, that we want a family-friendly, community-centered, and sensitive to the physically challenged users. None of those features right now we have. Handball courts, tennis courts uh, are, are sensitive to the physically challenged in wheelchairs. Last but not least is the cost. We believe our plan is very cost-effective and cost-efficient as compared to the city's plan C, a destructive and a costly endeavor. There's just 
we can't just fathom on why we have continued, the city continues to advocate for this plan. So let me um, share a little bit now that about our community. You know, when, what I found out is this, that quite amazing, or maybe not to, I should not be surprised that when you open it up to the community, you come to find out not only how much passion is out there about this part that has been so central to our life in this entire neighborhood, miles in the radius, but also how many talents actually exist in our community. The plan we are presenting today is with lots of community input of ideas, but also vetting those ideas with professional experts to test out their feasibility and design principles. For example, we have consulted with environmental experts, structure engineers, geostructure engineers who are willing to put their professional stamp on the plan to defend the structural validity of our plan. And landscape professors who also critique the conceptual plan C and our pro proposed conceptual frameworks. And lastly, we have well-known architectural landscape designer. One such individual who has worked alongside of us nonstop is Max Moriyama. He joins us with impeccable credentials and experiences. Our ideas have been vetted by him with careful considerations for not only park users, but also the environmental conditions and the impact of those conditions of this park. Max was actually born and raised in Huntington Beach, attended Edison High School across the park and grew up using this park. Today, he still frequents the park when he visits his parents who live nearby the park. Professionally, Max works at Lever Architecture and has experiences working on very notable landscape projects in leading design offices. Now, after he finished thing at UC Berkeley, he worked at the University Architecture Shop and his experiences in biology at Built Environment, which added his expertise in working with various environmental conditions. And we know Edison Park has very specific environmental conditions. His graduate work at University of Oregon well prepared him for architectural and landscape design. We have the best. Furthermore, Max is with impressive international experiences. In Copenhagen, he designed well-known climate resilient renovation of historic parks. Max also has spent years working on Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project in New York City with the most prestigious Ajarki Ingalls Group on major projects such as a 2.5 mile public park along east side of Manhattan. We are, I cannot tell you, we are just so fortunate, so fortunate to have his expertise. And he has given us hours upon hours and many suggestions considering the limitations as well as wonderful opportunities Edison Park presents for our community. We are especially like, um, we especially like Max concept of identifying the heart of the park while Edison Park truly becomes the heart of our community. That vision is a park with thriving energy life, balance for sports and non-sports users, and the green aesthetics that we all have always loved about this park. I'm going to invite Max to present the culmination of ideas that has been put forward as an ideal alternative to the city's conceptual plan C. So, Max, please. Thanks, Fingja. Uh, that's a really uh, generous intro. I just want to say that uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm happy to help out with this, and uh, really, what what we're presenting today is the culmination of uh, a lot of people's work and ideas, uh, all sort of compiled together. Um, screen. Um, so first, what I want to do is give a step-by-step -step analysis of Concept Plan C by RJM Group. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to highlight the biggest design moves they're making and show the impact they're having on the rest of the park so you can evaluate whether you think these trade-offs make sense. Uh, and then I'm going to present an alternative design created with our community group that we feel better addresses these design challenges at the park. So uh, to start, I think it's important to understand the sort of underlying logic that RJM is using to drive the design of their park. So here in red, you could see the extents of the Canary Street landfill. Uh, now with this, uh, the RJM in the city is saying that it's uh, costly to build on top of this. Uh, and because of that, it creates a park design, which sort of pushes everything off to the right. Now, we've actually spoken to geotech engineers uh, str uh, and structural engineers and have determined that actually it is possible to build in this zone. It just takes a little bit more engineering um, for hardscape structures and foundations. So, you know, the first question we pose is, is it better to fundamentally shift the entirety of the park off to the right in order to avoid a little bit of extra engineering? Uh, we don't think that that's the case. So um, in understanding that this is sort of the, the logic that's driving their design decisions, um, you can start to see why they make some of the moves that they're making. Uh, so the first I wanna highlight is the parking. So what you're looking at here is a new parking configuration. This runs along Magnolia and up into Stillwell. Um, and for me, what jumps out here is this looks more like a strip mall parking lot than a parking lot that would uh, correspond to, a, to a, a nice park. And you can see actually underneath here, this black footprint is the parking lot that's there today. So you can see it kind of has these playful arcs uh, and it feels a little bit more park-like. What's also important about this is this creates a natural setback off of Magnolia Street. And so when you're coming down Magnolia Street, what you see here is a park announcing itself to you as opposed to going down Magnolia Street and, and having two long parking lots on, on other side of you. Um, second, in order to build this parking lot, you're gonna have to completely demolish the existing parking lot, build something from scratch. Um, and on top of that, there's eight large healthy mature trees up here to the north off of Stillwell that you'd have to remove in order to, to create this brand new parking lot. So in my mind, what essentially they're proposing is a worse parking configuration that will kill trees that's also more costly. Uh, here's a look at some of these mature trees. So as you can see, this will take tens of years to reach the same uh, maturity level, uh, this large tree as well. Um, so that's the parking. Next is we looked at their attitude towards the sports court. So what you see here is actually not so different than the courts that are there today. Um, we have the same number of basketball courts. Uh, we have the same number of tennis courts, um, but an additional uh, eight pickleball courts. And actually they're converting two of the tennis courts into hybrid pickleball tennis courts. Um, you could see below here uh, the, the footprint that's there today. So with these new courts, they would be removing the racquetball court um, utilizing part of the footprint of the existing tennis courts uh, and then shifting everything over ever so slightly to the right. And in doing this, first off, they're not really avoiding the landfill. This is already, this is already on the clear portion of the landfill. So there's, there's really no need to move it over to the right. But uh, in order to move it over to the right, you need to demolish the existing courts. You need to take out all of the infrastructure, all the lighting infrastructure, uh, which is very costly. Then they're moving it ever so slightly to the right, which wipes out nine of the largest, healthiest mature trees uh, in the entire park. So if you look at the trees here, you can see how massive they are. Today, they're very nice. They, um, you know, they, they provide a really nice backdrop uh, along these uh, publicly used basketball courts. <clears throat> so the next big issue that we've identified is the they're proposing two large soccer fields in the outfield of the softball fields. So there's a logistics issue to this that we've identified um, speaking to the user groups in that softball and soccer schedules 
have a lot of conflicts and you can't use both of them at the same time. So that's inherently problematic. But the bigger issue actually is that in order to accomplish this, you'd have to kill 13 large, healthy, mature trees. And on top of this, um, for those who are familiar with the park, this area of the park is actually one of the nicest areas of the park. If you spend any, any time here, going for walks along this side of the park is really nice because there's so many like large mature trees. It's away from all the action. So there's a tranquility here. And, and here you feel the most uh, immersed in nature and in, in the entirety of the park. So to turn that over to huge soccer fields is, is, is kind of a shame and it kind of ignores the, the, the existing state of the, of the park. Here's a look at some of those trees here. Uh, trees here. Um, so a, a big criticism that we also have uh, of this plan is the pump track. So it's it's very large. We're not against pump tracks in general, but this is an all, this is almost an acre large pump track. And what that means is to have something this large in the park means that you have to take something else out of the park. And here it's done at the expense of passive space um, and, and, and nature and green and trees. Uh, and, it, and it just contributes to this overall feeling of the park just being overwhelmed with the number of sports courts. Um, and on top of that, this wasn't supported in either our community group survey or, or the, the survey done by RJ and the city. This is kind of a summary slide looking at the 43 healthy mature trees that would need to be taken out for this design. So next what I wanna do is go through an alternative approach. Um, I wanna walk you through step-by-step step and explain uh, our thought process on how we would approach the park design, uh, hopefully demonstrate the value of this alternative approach compared to concept plan C. Um, and, you know, start to think of the park as something more than just um, grass, trees, and, and sports courts. So um, to give an understanding of our approach, what we, what we did was we looked at what's existing there today uh, as, sort, as sort of our uh, first step. So some of the bigger elements, the parking, the community center, the fire department, um, and then all of the sports courts. So uh, identifying them here, it looks like these, the, the elements um, surrounded in green here, as well as the trees. Uh, having a specific attitude about these elements as, you know, these are, they're working well, there's a design logic embedded in them. Um, it, it's, it's cheaper to restore what's already there than to demolish and make new. So if it's already working then, and we're able to make a design that works with this, then it's the, the, we believe the smartest thing to do. So similarly, I wanna start with parking, which is sort of a, a very pragmatic first step. Um, here, what you can see is uh, an, an alternative proposal to what RJM is, is uh, proposing. Uh, simply what we wanna do is put uh, one additional row, sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse here. Um, if you see here on the north, by just adding one additional row of parking, we can add 28 spots. Um, and then down to the southern lot, by making a, a bend here, we could add 11 spots and then filling in the rest of the parking lots, we could pick up another seven. And what's interesting about this is, this is actually double the amount of parking spots that RJM is proposing um, by completely uh, uh, demolishing this parking lot and, and building a new one. So, we feel like this is a no-brainer of something very minimal we could do to save money, to preserve uh, the, the design sensibility of the park uh, and, uh, and um, sort of a no-brainer for a step. So next, we wanted to take a look at what the existing courts were today uh, and fields. Um, essentially, what we want to do is provide the same level of sports courts that our jam is providing as well. So um, we're proposing to keep the basketball courts exactly where they are today, but to just restore them. Uh, we would also like to re retain the racquetball courts because we've actually identified that a lot of people use these courts. And by just 
um, perhaps commissioning a, a, a muralist to, to paint a mural on this, we could breathe new life into this, into the racquetball courts. Um, we would like to restore the tennis courts. And as I mentioned earlier, by just thickening the slab here, um, just ever so slightly, this would allow us to build on top of the sort of unstable soil. Um, and similarly to our jam, we would propose to keep the softball fields as they are today, as they are pretty heavily utilized. Um, so uh, also um, to, 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 to try to match RJM, uh, we would propose to add new pickleball courts here as well. This spot here is centrally located. It's by the other courts. Uh, it requires, it, it, we wouldn't have to take out any trees to, to get this. And so in a way we're able to match the number of pickleball and tennis courts as RJM um, just by cleaning up what's there today and adding new courts here. So the next big piece of the puzzle is the soccer fields. And as you can see here, RJ, this is the layout that RJM is proposing. It's a lot of square footage. Um, to have this much of the park become soccer fields uh, starts to, to, to dictate the rest of, of what you can do with the rest of the park. So um, in conversations with AYSO, we um, propose this configuration of soccer fields as well as to reduce the number of soccer fields. So instead of two full-size soccer fields, we propose to just have one. Instead of three smaller U10 fields, we would propose to just have two. Um, and we would propose to put them um, in, a, in a place where it's minimally uh, obstructive to the park. So putting them here would only, you would only need to kill a few trees and then uh, you'd be able to save a huge growth of old mature trees. So um, up until this point, this is like a very pragmatic way to approach the park design. It has to do with logistics and just fitting large, um, large sports fields in the place. So uh, what we wanted to do next was uh, bring some park back into the park. And what we mean by that is the way that we look at the rest of the park, um, how, can, how can we see it as a place of nature and landscape and trees uh, and, and, and something quite beautiful? So the first step here is what we're calling the green sports buffer, which is for all of the sports fields, you actually wrap them in a vegetative uh, screen, so to speak. So not only is it more enjoyable to play in these sports fields because you're surrounded by trees and green and landscape, but this actually, this actually acts as a, as a sound barrier for the rest of the park. Um, similarly, we've identified that there's this central area here, which we think is sort of the, the highest design opportunity of the entire park. And the reason for that is because from this central zone here, A, there are not a lot of trees there to begin with. Um, B, it's sort of hardscape that's a little bit in disrepair and, and wanting something new to happen. Um, and it's, it's connected to, to everything else in the park. So from this central heart, you can go to the basketball courts, the tennis courts, the pickleball courts, the ragwall courts, softball and soccer. Um, it becomes the, 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 um, the key uh, uh, um, ambition of the park in a way. So what we're proposing here is a program that's a little more ecologically oriented, um, something that brings back more landscape, uh, passive and uh, communal activities. So here we're proposing a, a picnic green, uh, which is pretty generous in size. You can imagine here there can be shade structures and uh, picnic tables, uh, people laying out uh, adjacent to some of the sports games. Uh, community gardens would be a new novel program, which we think could bring a lot of beauty to the park. Um, Friends of Edison Park, for example, uh, we know would love to have a space to be able to grow and showcase different types of plants. Um, our proposal for instead of a, you know, generic tot lot is something more along the lines of a nature playground. So here you could see that it looks more like a, a dunescape with wild vegetation growing. So children can play in something that looks more like a landscape than a, than a jungle gym uh, on, a, on a blacktop. And then lastly, 
instead of a pump track and skate park, we've sort of combined the two into a more compact footprint, which is actually still pretty generous. Um, but the idea here is we would wrap it in plants in a way that would shield the, the shield and buffer the noise of the rest of the park from the skate park. But also for the skaters using this, it would be quite nice to, to, to be skating under a canopy and, and shade of trees. So we're thinking about the experience within this and then also how it works for the rest of the park. So taking this logic a bit further, we've expanded it to, um, to, to, to encompass the entirety of the park and create meandering walking paths that allow you to experience different landscapes, different forms of nature, um, go to active zones where there's more sports, go to, to um, places of, of uh, relaxation and tranquility maybe. So labeled here, you could see along these paths, we could have picnic tables, we can identify different nature walks, um, we could have, uh, you know, we could, we could, we could actually sort of restore and, and, and um, uh, the, the, the area to, in the, in the softball outfield. Um, and then, you know, um, having native landscapes uh, along these sort of meandering paths. So this is a way for people to move around the park in a more passive way who aren't necessarily there for sports alone. This is a summary slide here, which uh, I can just hang on to for a sec. It shows our the number of, of sports courts that we have. Um, and that's sort of the, the design that we have um, like to propose to the community member as an as an alternative to the community as an alternative to the RJM plan. Um, I next want to go through and just in a summary fashion highlight the merits of our plan compared to what RJM is proposing. So um, the first we feel is a kind of a no-brainer. Uh, this is the parking comparison. If you look at the RJM plan, they've added 23 new parking spots. With what we're proposing, you can add 46. Theirs would require a complete demolition and new construction. That's 115,000 square footage of new construction, whereas ours would only be 17,000 square footage of new construction to achieve more parking spots. So we're saying less, less money and more parking spots. Um, here's the, the tree comparison. So you could see that our plan is significantly more sensitive to the mature trees that are there today. Theirs requires 43, killing 43 healthy mature trees. Ours would only require 16. Um, and here's the, the big sports differences. So essentially our plan would provide all of the same sports fields and courts that concept plan C is providing um, with the exception of the pump track, one large scale soccer field and uh, one small scale soccer field. Um, and then alternatively, ours is proposing to keep the racquetball courts sort of instead. Uh, and lastly, here you can see the open space comparison. So if you think about the space outside of the sports fields, the walkways, the hardscape, um, concept plan C has 13.6 acres. Ours has a little bit more well, a, a bit more, 18.7 acres. Um, and this is how you would define open passive space. So um, in, in a comparison, the park today has even more open, open passive space. And this is something that people... So I'll just leave you here with our, um, our plan up on the screen uh, for a second uh, for people to take in, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to Dinja. Thank you. You're muted, Ding Joe. Thank you, Max, for, for your work in uh, really incorporating the ideas of the community and also what's feasible. 
uh, you can tell since you're leaving this on a little bit longer, looking at, you know, reiterating again, the no brainer of parking, not destroying mature trees. And we were able to have double what the plan C is without the destruction. And I, I just do not know what else to say about that. Even if they just accept the parking idea is already saving thousands of not just dollars, but trees and open space as well. And uh, the pickleball, we added just the same number. So I'm hoping that our pickleball friends will be just as happy because this is a new sport. And that's why we welcome the new users, you know, coming to the park. So I wanted to to really thank you again for the hours that you have spent working with us as a community group. Thank you for uh, incorporating and articulating many of those key elements uh, that we felt is important uh, by the community survey. And still there are many opportunities that yet to explain in greater details. So in conclusion, um, based on the city's own limited outreach, it's the very limited outreach and our group's community assessment, there's, there's definitely a clear misalignment of what the community wants in the city's plan C. The imbalance of the sports and non-sports, active, passive part of the park in the plan C, and the total disregard um, for environmental impact of cutting down the great majority of healthy, large, mature trees. Um, by the way, RJM designer actually said on August 4th that he will replace those trees with palm trees, believe it or not, <laughs> which you can tell what the community's reaction is on that day. Plan C squeezing in and sneaking in features such as the palm track desired by few, yet taking out handball and racquetball courts actually used by so many, not just handball, racquetball players, soccer players and many others who use those um, courts. And you may say that, oh, that ugly concrete structure. No, we can be very creative and bring the arts to the park. We have already talked about having beautiful murals and trying to, uh, why we preserve this um, court uh, used by so many. So we don't want to sacrifice unnecessary and valuable green space and mature trees for straight mall, uh, parking lot and then resulting in half the parking stalls increase from our plan is just totally unconscionable. If you're in agreement with us, um, please, I'm gonna bring my slide up to give you action steps. Okay, you can, oh, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Great. If you want to join us in our effort and you're internally not already a part of our Edison Park community group, please send us your email at saveedisonpark at gmail.com and uh, we will keep you on our list. And also send city council emails to express your own feelings about Plan C and our Edison Park community's uh, group plan. And three is that join us on October 30th 12 to 3 p.m. for our third community fun field gathering to update you on the park, engage you with your ideas, as well as giving you lots of updates. And so our Huntington Beach favor band, Let It Be, the Beatles cover band, and Ruby's food truck will be here uh, again. So, you know, we really can be the change we want to see if we just work together. It is really our Edison our community groups go that we work in unity with such diverse park users, community residents, and it is also our goal to work in unity with the city and in hope that they will yield to the community's needs and desires, ideas, and not insisting on profit-based designer developers or fee-based um, recreational programs. We have invited the city council members the mayor, city council candidates to attend our webinar today, expecting that they too will see that we can be responsible, that they can have responsible options presented to them other than plan C and to listen to the authentic voices of the community. So 
I want to thank you for being here today to listen, to learn about our alternative plan. We thought that this is the only way we're going to actually be able to communicate, especially the city council and the commission members. Uh, we, we have requested meetings to present, but we have not been granted permission to present these comprehensive ideas that cannot be expressed in little sticky post-it notes. So we want to thank, thank the Edison Park Community Group who are with us. We're together on every Saturday morning on Zoom planning meetings. This has been nonstop since uh, last December. So there are a lot of committed people. There are a lot of interested um, people. There are a lot of people who want to see the change um, that the city will not approve uh, Plan C. So the community is the wind behind our wings. So thank you all of the community groups that you are uh, working together. This is how we will achieve the outcome. And you're again, if you're not part of the group, we welcome you to join us by sending us an email to saveedisonpark at gmail.com. Thank you very much for your attendance today and we'll see you at the park on October 30th. Thank you. We have a, a few minutes left. Uh, we were hoping to keep this under an hour. Uh, we have a few minutes left. There, there have been questions that have been asked and answered. Um, so our, our goal was to make certain that if any questions are still remaining, please email them at save, uh, email them to at saveedisonpark at gmail.com. You can also, if you have questions, uh, there are many people, many of our group that are in the park on a daily basis. So please feel free to talk, get to know your neighbors, get to know, get to know the people that are using the park. And if, if best, see you on October 30th. Thank you.